Would you remain standing for the reading of the word? We're going to read today out of Genesis chapter 3. It's probably the most horrible passage in the entire scripture. Without this passage, life would be pretty good. So let's read it, and it's only uphill from here. Or down. It's good from here, okay? Genesis 3, starting with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, he said to Eve, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the... Uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. At which point Eve should have said, we already are like God. Shut up, right? That would end of story. Bible would be very short in that, okay? And you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> you may be seated. We'll get back in it. We'll get back to the flow. Thank you, band, so much. And Eddie, thank you, brother. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let me pull this back up. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you are behind me. Have you guys, um, think about this for a minute. In your life, and I'm sure this is true of all of us, in your life, do you ever get to a season, especially if you're older, like Amaya, you turned 14. You might not be there yet, okay? When you turn 40, you might be here. Where, where all of a sudden, at some point in your life, it hits you. Something hits you, and you look, and you're like, how did I get here? I don't even need to say anything else. Anybody with me? You're like, what, what happened? Like, this wasn't the original plan. This wasn't the, the goal at the beginning of this. Somehow I'm here. Good, bad, indifferent, you're, you're here. So here you are, and you're like totally off the path that you had set forth for yourself, or you felt God had set forth for you at some point in time, and, and all of a sudden you've drifted, and you find yourself here. Now, in this season, you're like, okay, it could be relational. It could be financial. It could be your career, right? For many of us, think about, let's, let's go here. How many of us, it could be our character, like our life with godliness and righteousness and sin, and all of a sudden, we're in a spot where like, what, what happened? Like, I, at the beginning, this would have not, not been my path. This is not what I chose. This is not where I thought I would be, but here I am. Somewhere along the way, I have drifted. I didn't see the drift, but somehow I have gotten here, you ever notice the areas of our lives where, like the inconsequential, the, the things that don't really matter, those places of our life that, that drift? Every single Sunday, you guys don't see it, I see it. There, there's a place in this church alone where every single Sunday something, something drifts, and it's that stupid clock on that pole right there, okay? Did you notice there's a clock there? That, that's for us, that's for me. It's like, okay, we're going too long. It doesn't start flashing, but I know it's there. I'm, I know that clock is there. The problem is that clock is, oh, today is actually the same because I think Zach's, oh, nope, it just went off. Zach said it last week. It, it's pretty close right now, but give it a couple weeks, and you're gonna notice that all of a sudden it's gonna be like 10.38 our time. You're looking at your watch, which you know, if you have an Apple Watch or an iPhone or maybe an Android, I don't know if Androids are right, but we're gonna go with iPhones being the standard. And you're like, hey, this is right, but that clock is like two minutes ahead or two minutes behind. I'm like, what happened? What happened? It wasn't that Zach or Duran when they set that thing, because I'm too scared to get up on a ladder, and they set that thing. It's not like they're like going, hey, let's fast forward it two minutes so Rob will hurt. Maybe they do. And they're like, maybe this, he'll read it and be like, hey, get up at this time and get done at this time. But that's not what happened. That clock, for whatever reason, is, it, 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 it has drifted. Like it might just be one second per hour, which doesn't seem like a really big deal when you think about that, right? One second per hour, not a big deal until you realize at the end of a 24-hour period, you're off by 24 seconds. At the end of the week, you've got a couple minutes and all of a sudden this thing is really, really in trouble and needs to be recalibrated. Now that, that's inconsequential. It, it's not a big deal, but when you drift, you drift. Now, there are actions in our lives where there are more consequences. For those of you guys that were alive in the 80s, I don't know if you guys remember this, but in 1983, Korean Airlines had a flight from Anchorage, Alaska, intended to go to Seoul, um, Seoul, Korea. And instead of going to Seoul, Korea, because the instruments were off by one degree, 
the navigation system on the plane. I think it was a 737 or 747. The, cool, the flight number was 007. That's kind of cool. It's Korean Airlines 007. And this flight was off by one degree, and the pilot didn't know it. So they're flying, and when you take off, you're going in the right direction towards Seoul. What they didn't know is that they were drifting, and they ended up drifting over a peninsula in the Soviet Union. And... Soviets shot down this plane. It ended up in the Sea of Japan. I think something like 260, 270 passengers died that day because the instrumentation was off by one degree. So they had drifted. They didn't even know they drifted, which leads me in my life. There's so many areas of my life where I'm about to turn 50, and I'm like, whoa, 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 this wasn't the plan. Like, how did you get here? And so there are seasons in our life where we can't just put a Band-Aid on it to fix it right? You can't just go to therapy and fix this thing. It's like, there needs to be a whole recalibration. Like, we need to go back to the standard. What do we need to do to get back to the path that God has placed us on in these certain areas of our lives? And that's what we're doing in this series. The series on church matters, the matters of the church. Let's recalibrate ourselves, and let's go back to the Word of God, what the Word of God says, because there's areas of our life that we're drifting, and we might not even know it. And so it might be personal, it might be in your family, it might be for us as a church. Where have we drifted? What do we need to do about it? So where we've started, what I wanted to start with, we're covering a number of things in this series. We're talking about the, the gospel matters, we're talking about being a Christian matters, the church matters, church membership matters, but we're starting with the gospel. Because if we get the gospel right, if we understand the gospel, we at least understand the path. And that's where we need to calibrate ourselves to is the gospel. So last week was part one of this message, and we talked about the gospel. What is it? Remember, we went to a Puritan message board and asked them, hey, help us, teach us what the gospel is. And we got all these answers. All of them were good answers, but they were also all insufficient answers. They weren't complete. They weren't total. So we got answers like, well, the gospel is love God, love neighbor, end of story. Well, just because you say end of story doesn't actually make it end of story. And you, you ever been there? Melanie and I have this all the time. I'm like, well, just because you said it's true doesn't make it's true, you know? So if she says it's true, it's probably true. But just because you say this is the end of the story, it's not the end of the story. Another person said, the gospel is when Jesus smiles on you and looks at you in favor. I'm like, that's so hippie. That, that is so weird. That's just like, oh, yeah, that's weird. Weird vibes, all of it. But okay, yeah, Jesus is smiling on you and Jesus, yeah, that, that's good. And there's all of these different things that this message board had on it. The problem is none of these messages or none of these responses gave us the totality of the gospel. And so we gave a four-part introduction of what the gospel actually is. There's four parts to the gospel. God, man, Christ, response. God, man, Christ, response. Now, here's the thing. If you take away any of those four things, you no longer have the gospel. This doesn't eliminate God. You can't eliminate one and all of a sudden God doesn't stand as truth. No, that's not the case. I'm saying the gospel. It's not the totality of the gospel if you take away any one of these four items. Also, if you reorder them, if you put them in any kind of um, non-sequential order, it's no longer the gospel either. It is in a particular order that we get the gospel. So last week, we started it by going through the first one, which is by far the most important one, okay? And it sets the foundation for everything else. So what we wanted to do last week and this week is talk about the gospel. What is it? Because you're, we're going to present this in our church over and over again. Hey, guys, talk about the gospel. Preach the gospel. Share the gospel. Read the gospel. Love the gospel, okay? What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is God, man, Jesus, response. Now let's unpack this. So last week, we looked at this idea, not this idea, we looked at the person of God and who he is, and, the main, and this is so foundational. The main thing we need to understand is that he's two things. He is creator and he's holy. If we understand this about God, then we can understand who we are as his creation. But if we don't know who he is, we don't understand who we are. Who is God? Well, he's creator, which means all things are originated and initiated by him which means he owns you and he possesses you. He's the author, he's the potter, you're the clay. And we don't like that with our freedom mindset in America. We don't want to be possessed by anybody, but the truth is, whether you like it or not, God owns you. He created you. Now, will you be willing to sub subject yourself, submit yourself to the beauty of that ownership? He owns you, he created you, which means he designed you with purpose. You're not an accident. He didn't overlook you. You are here, this baby being born by Zach and Laura tomorrow, little, little baby guy who's gonna be adorable. There's purpose and design on this little one's life as there was for you. Even if the world or your friends or your lack of parents has told you from day one that you have no 
purpose, that you were a mistake. God says that's just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. I say that you were designed with purpose because I created you. I am your owner. I am your father. So that's who he is. And then secondly, he's holy. And this is a part of God that we often overlook. We're like, yeah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He was, he is, he is to come. Revelation, we read it, we sang it. We're like, he is holy. Well, what does holy mean? It means he is wholly complete. He is wholly perfect. He is entirely without sin, complete and utter righteousness. And because he's holy, nothing unholy can stand in his presence. This is the foundation. If we don't understand that, we will never understand the gospel. We will never understand worship. We will never understand what we sing on Sunday mornings or what we read in our scriptures if we don't understand, first and foremost, God is creator and God is holy. So now we jump and we go to the next three things. The next three things, they're, they're, they're really practical, but they all fall under this umbrella of who God is. If you don't know who God is, nothing else makes sense. So today, let's talk about the rest of the gospel. God, man, Christ, Response. We've already talked about God. Let's talk about man. Let's talk about us. And by man, generic, man, woman, this is us, okay? This isn't just Adam and Eve. This, this, unfortunately, is all of us. And I'm telling you, this goes in the face of what culture says about man. Let's, let's talk about this. Now, would you admit with me that in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, God creates everything, everything. And when he creates man, wouldn't you say Adam and Eve had it made, like, They really had it made. A luscious garden, called to rule, have dominion over everything, no sin, no need for clothes. That part's awesome. No need for clothes, right? No need to look over your shoulder wondering who's going to get you. Like, everything is peaceful. You're walking with God. You're communing with God. Everything is good. So in the beginning, he creates, God creates everything. So we got Mount, well, he divides um, light from dark, Earth from, or sky from ground, water from ground, animals, vegetation, fruit, all different kinds of animals, interesting animals, antelope, dogs, I get that, even cats, even cats, as hard as that is for me to say, even cats, he creates all of this. Then in the middle of it all, and we talked about this before in the glory series, in the middle of it all, he creates man. He puts man in the middle of it, Adam and Eve, I'm referring to both of them, to have dominion and rule and reign over all of creation without sin. And he's created one creation in his image, the Imago Dei, the image of God in his likeness, and that is us. He certainly didn't create cats in his image or dogs in his image or elephants in his image or trees or mountains in his image. He created us in his image. Remember last week I talked to you guys about this, what Louis Giglio says about that moment. It's not scriptural, but it's kind of a cool thought that we were so much created in the image of God that when we walked by the rest of creation, I'm sure that there were animals or trees that did a double take thinking they were seeing God because we were in his image. We had his character. We had his heart. This is who we were. And man, I'm like, Adam and Eve, what a life. That's so beautiful. That's incredible what you had in that moment. And what did we do with it? We traded it all in for our glory. We read it in this story in in Genesis chapter three just a moment ago, the the fall of man is what this is known as. Did you notice how long it took man to fall? The Bible has 66 books in it. The very first book is where we fail. The third chapter is where we fail. And we were created in the second chapter. It took us about half a chapter to screw everything up. And then the rest of the Bible is spent redeeming everything that we screwed up. So we look back at Adam and Eve, they were given the Imago Dei, glory of God, everything in life is an image of God, a reflection of God, here we are, and all is good, and Eve and Adam, and I'm not gonna throw Eve under the bus without throwing Adam's right there beside her, guys. So guys, we're not off the hook. He should have been protecting, he should have been doing his job, they both failed, they both failed miserably. Now, in that moment, the serpent, the devil comes up to them and tempts them, And our thought, it's kind of a Snow White kind of understanding of the scriptures, is we believe that the reason mankind fell into sin was over an apple, right? Satan's like, hey, you want some fruit? Ladies and gentlemen, if if the downfall of mankind was over a piece of fruit, I've got some serious words for Adam and Eve one day, right? At least let it be a steak or a pizza, but not a fruit. And if it's going to be a fruit, how about a peach? right? Or an orange, but not it. I mean, apples? Come on. So this, it doesn't even say apple. And, and so we've got this idea that the fall of man was because Eve ate a piece of fruit. It's not that at all. 
It all lies in this understanding of what the serpent said. The serpent comes to Eve and he says this. He said, did God really say? Remember in our study of Satan in the book of Revelation, we talked about this. He's an accuser and he's a deceiver. All he wants to do, he, he's never gonna come to you and go like, hey, my, God's ways are good. My ways are really terrible and evil and wicked. You should do my ways. Here's my ways, my bad stuff. Follow me in bad stuff. He doesn't do that. Instead, he tries to convince you that God's stuff is holding you back from the good stuff. He wants to get you off just a little bit. He wants to get you off just a degree. And if he can get you off just a degree, he knows that you're going to drift. And sooner or later, you're gonna be like, how did I get here? Just let, let's be real for a minute and please don't answer out loud. In your heart of hearts with the sins in your life that you struggle with, the sins of your life that you struggle with, when you first started doing and committing that sin, something you look at, an anger problem, an attitude, something that you're cheating on or a financial mis whatever it was, when you first started, were you like, you know what? I really think this sounds good. I'm gonna go after that. No, 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 it was a 1% off course drift and all of a sudden you find yourself so far from the course that you're like, what happened? And this is Satan's work. And this is what man did. In that moment, it's not about eating of the apple. It's that we fell for this trap of did God really say? Where the serpent put this seed of doubt in Eve's mind and in Adam's mind. Of maybe God, maybe God doesn't care about us. Maybe God is selfish and he, he's withholding from us. So all of a sudden, what happened? This was a glory struggle. This was a glory problem. At this moment, everything in life, and still to this day, everything in the universe is about God. We are not the center of the universe. As much as we wanna believe we are, as much as culture is telling us that it's all about us, what we know, I mean, we know it can't be true because there was a time when we weren't and he was. So everything in the universe is about God. Everything revolves around him. And in the garden, we said, nah, I want it to be about me. And we've been fighting that same problem ever since. And, as much, and I've talked about this in years past. As much as when we get to heaven, I wanna have a conversation with Adam and Eve, assuming they're there, assuming they're there, assuming I'm there. I'm like, I, I wanna have a conversation with them. Like, what, why did you, you ruined it for everybody, man for everybody. And then they'd be like, yeah, you would have blown it too. It just so happens that we drew the short straw and we went first, right? Because Romans 3 says what? Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. It doesn't say Adam and Eve have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Ephesians 2 says that we're born dead in our trespasses and sin, but we also, according to Romans 3, we also all sinned. That's all of us. Now, here's the problem with our culture right now, and even the culture of the church. We don't think sin is a very big deal. We take it very lightly. But what I wanna propose to us is if we understand that God is both creator and he's holy, then all of a sudden our sin takes a different tint. If God is holy, created us in his image to bear glory for him, then maybe sin isn't just a, oops, my bad, but maybe it's a really really big deal. At the heart of culture, culture says that humans are basically good and that we think good thoughts and we do good things and that's our ten tendency, that's the way that we do it. Now, have anybody in here besides me ever gotten a traffic violation, like a minor traffic violation, just something in, in subsequential? Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, 2015, 2016, I don't even wanna go into this story very deeply. It's not, it really isn't that big of a deal, but in 2016, I got a traffic violation for something silly. Um, I was at school, I was at seminary, so it had to be been 2014, 2015. And it was lunch break and I was in a hurry, so my school is in Oviedo, uh, Mitchell Hammock Road, where Red Bug turns in down by Mitchell Hammock. And, so I wanted to go to Chipotle because back in the day, that's all I ate. Now I hate Chipotle. And so it's on Red Bug Lake Road. You guys know where the Chipotle is by Publix and, and that market. So I'm coming towards 436 from Mitchell Hammock and I'm not paying attention, which is not abnormal. Um, and I missed my turn, completely missed my turn. And as soon as I pass the traffic light, I'm like, oh man, I'm already in a crunch for time. I've got to get back to class. Um, these are the days when our kids were much young. Teen so I had two teenagers at home. Haley, you were an easy, easy kid as a middle schooler. So I had a lot on my mind. And so I had teenagers at home. I'm in seminary. I'm pastoring this church. A lot on my mind. I drive past this thing, miss Chipotle. I'm like, oh man. And so I'm like, I'm going to take the next turnaround. Turn and I drive a mile and there's no place to do a U-turn. 
And finally, there's a traffic light, and on it is a big no U-turn sign, and I see it. I see it. Would you ignore it? You have. How many of you guys turning on to Douglas Avenue from 434 do, or you need the 7-Eleven gas station, you do a U-turn there, even though it says no U-turn? Sinners, 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 <laughs> sinners. And you have no idea how much I judge those people that do that, even though I do it. So I'm pointing my finger. I'm such a hypocrite. And, and so that day I did a U-turn, get almost all the way back to Chipotle and the sirens come on. Cop pulls me over. Sir, do you know what you did? Fortunately, I didn't compound my sin. I'm like, yes, sir. The, no U-turn. I did. And so he's like, yep, that's exactly what you did. I'm not going to give you a ticket. I have no idea how I got out of a ticket. He said, I'm going to give you this violation. I want you to go to the DMV. You pay this. It will not be on your, on your um, record ever, and, and there won't be points. It won't affect your insurance. Just go pay it. Cool. So the next day I go to the DMV, pay it. $10. $10. This happened 2014, 2015. You know the next time I thought about this? Last week when I was writing this. Hadn't thought about it in years. You know what? To this day, telling you, confessing it to you, I don't feel badly about that thing at all. Zero percent. If I would go back and do it, I would probably do it again because it's just a minor traffic violation. No big deal. It cost me 10 bucks. No skin off my back. No points on my record. It's just like, ah, it's just, it's just a minor traffic violation. And here's the grip. In our lives with sin, we think whatever sin we do is just a minor traffic violation. It's like, oops. It's like Brittany, right? Oops. I did it again. No big deal. Just wash it under a bit. No, no big deal at all. And so we don't have a proper understanding of sin. But here's what we got to understand when it comes to the gospel. We need to understand that sin is a much bigger deal than I think you and I give it credit for. Sin is the breaking, not just the stretching of a relationship. Sin is the breaking of a relationship. Sin is a rejection of God himself. Snubbing God's rule, snubbing God's care, God's law, God's direction, God's authority, all of it when we sin. If God is creator and created us with purpose and design to obey him and live our best life if we obey him. And if he's holy and we sin against that holiness, it's a much bigger deal than oops. And we need to understand that. Our culture has done a good job downplaying sin. The message of culture is that you and I are born into this world innocent and basically good. And we have to determine in that moment, do we believe scripture or do we believe culture? Or culture says you're a good person. Culture says you're born good and innocent. I mean, wait till you see this baby come out tomorrow, right? This baby, I know this baby's going to be adorable. Their kids are adorable. And this baby's going to come out, and Ephesians chapter two says that this baby is born dead in his trespasses and sin. We're like, I don't like the Bible then. Well, it doesn't matter if you like it or not, if it's true. And, and so this is the condition of our heart. And the world says, no, we are good and we are innocent. And the Bible says, no, you're born with a sin problem because you inherited it from your grandparents, Adam and Eve. And the minute they broke the law of God, it wasn't an oopsie, it changed everything. Greg Gilbert, last week I presented a quote to you by Greg Gilbert who said an emaciated gospel or a frail gospel leads to an emaciated worship. If you have a frail understanding of the gospel, then your worship is going to be frail. He also said this. Now listen to this. This is a cool quote too. He says, the Bible's teaching is that sin is indeed a breaking of relationship with God, but that broken relationship consists in a rejection of his kingly majesty. It's not just adultery, though it is that, it is also rebellion. It's not just betrayal, it's also treason. What if we called sin treason? That hits differently, doesn't it? So it's not just being betrayal or just doing betrayal, it's also treason. If we reduce sin to a mere breaking of relationship rather than understanding it as the traitorous rebellion of, beloved sub of a beloved subject against his good and righteous king, we will never understand why the death of God's son was required to address it. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, when we get to the part about Christ, it doesn't make sense if you and I are good. If there's no sin in the way, if it's just an oopsie, if it's just a minor traffic violation, then what good does the cross do? But instead, there's a holy God, and then there's us, the traitorous race. And the Bible says that when we sin, there are consequences. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Sin is separated from the, us from the holy God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. 
That's terrifying. The God that holds your breath, provides your breath, provides your thought in your heartbeat. This God in our sin has been distanced from us because he's holy and we're unholy. Romans 6.23, and we go over this in every membership class. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the gospel wrapped up right here. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And what's the punishment for our sin? Well, Romans 6 says, 6.23 says, the wages of our sin is death. Remember this, what is a wage? A wage is what is rightfully yours. You have earned this. In your jobs, tomorrow you will go to work because you have some kind of written or unwritten contract with your employer. And the contract says something to the effect of, I'm going to provide this service and you are going to provide me cash. You're going to pay me because we don't do that bartering thing where I work and you give me a cow. I'm going to work and you're going to give me cash. This is how it's going to work. So if I put in my 40 hours, at the end of the week, you are legally bound to pay me the agreed upon hourly rate or salary. That is mine. That's my wage. I've earned it. And if you were to ever not pay me, and I can't tell you over the years how many of you guys have had bosses that don't pay you. That's frustrating. But they legally owe that to you so you can take it to a court or to a third-party arbiter. And you can be like, listen, this was the agreed upon contract. And the judge or the arbiter will say, yes, you're right. You owe them this. This is your wage. This is what they have earned by contract. And Paul says in Romans 6, because of your sin, the wage, the thing that is legally and rightfully yours and mine is death. And we're not just talking dying of old age when you're 85. We're talking about eternal separation from holy God in hell, that kind of death. This is the wage. This is what we deserve. This is what we've earned, our legal consequence of our sin. So sin, I want us to understand this. In the gospel, yes, God is holy. It's important that we understand that foundation, but it's just as important that we understand who we are compared to him. We are unholy. We are unrighteous. We're not just oopsie, we're wicked. We're rebels. We're traitors against a holy God, and that's a big deal, and it has eternal consequences. Fortunately, the gospel doesn't have just two points, God and man. If it ended there, would you agree we're hosed? Like that's really bad news. That's not good news at all, but the gospel has two more points. So we've got God, holy creator, man, we, we're not just kind of, uh, but we're sinners, we're traitors in this thing. Now enter the third part of the gospel, Christ. And I cannot say this loudly or clearly enough, and I need you to understand, this is the point of today. If you do not first understand our condition, depraved, sinful, in light of a holy God, you will never understand the full beauty of what Jesus has done for you. If you're like, oh, Jesus died on a cross for my sin, cool, now I get to go to heaven. No, 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 you don't understand. Jesus died for your sin, and the wages of that sin is eternal suffering and death apart from him. That's a really big deal. That's what you've earned. That's what's rightfully yours. That's your wage. But Jesus, he steps in. And so when we understand the beauty of what he's done, then our worship is no longer emaciated. It's no longer weak. It's no longer frail. Jesus says in Luke 7, those that have been forgiven little, love little. Those that have been forgiven and understand that they've been forgiven, love much. So let's play this scenario. Again, we've done this in our church membership classes. This is one of my favorite scenarios to go through. And I've, this is something I thought about when I was a youth pastor. So this is old, really old. But let's play. Can we, can we play God for just a minute? Like, don't walk out of here with a God complex. As soon as we're done with this illustration, you need to put that hat down, okay? So don't carry it with you to lunch. Let's play Almighty God for, for just a moment. If you were God, and the creation that you created as the centerpiece of your glory, like you created everything, mountains and glaciers and streams and air and sky and sun and the universe, you created it all and it all exemplifies you, it all points to you and your glory. But then you create five foot eight man, average height, five foot eight man. And you said, there's the apple of my eye. They look like me, they have my character, they have my DNA, they, they are going to exemplify me the most. Now go, rule and reign and represent me to all of creation. And of all, of all the creatures that you create, the one that you created in your glory becomes the traitorous race. Because they say, this isn't enough. I want more. I want to be on the throne. 
of my life. Matter of fact, I want to be on the throne of the universe, God, and we become the traitor race. If you were God, again, you're wearing the hat for a minute, you're sitting on the throne for a minute. If you were God, what do you do to that creation? There's three options. We've talked about these in the membership class. Number one is ignore him or ignore man. Just completely ignore us. Now, now, some of you guys in conflict, this is your MO. This is your mode of operation. Like fight or flight. And you're like, flight, totally, ignore it. Check engine lights on in my car, ignore it. It will go away, right? I have to have a difficult conversation with somebody I love, ignore it, it will go away. Does it ever go away? No, it gets worse. And then it blows up. And so God could do that. He could ignore us, ignore their sin, But the problem is, if he ignores us, the sin is still there. The blemish on his canvas of the eternal glory painting of the universe has been tarnished. So he really can't ignore, I guess he can, but if he does, his glory statement of the universe has been tarnished. Option number two. So option number one, ignore us. Option number two is the option I would pick, and so probably would you. Smite us. Red button in the sky. Pick up the red phone. Go get them. Like, wipe them out, right? And I'm not talking Noah's Ark type wiping out where there's a remnant of a few people left over. I'm like, get them all. All of them are traitors. All of them are evil. All of them are horrible. Let's get rid of them. Let's go back to just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and some cows, and we will be good. No more man. Wipe them out, right? Anybody? Would that be your option? Because you created them in your image, and they tried to take your throne, and they are still doing that to this day. Get rid of them. Ignore them smite them, or number three, the unthinkable, right? And you already know where we're going. Redeem them. Redeem them. Redeem them, which, by the way, when we think about the redemption of God, we need to understand and, and that his plan in this was to send Jesus, where he says, hey, go put on human skin. You've been around eternally with me in fellowship with me and the Holy Spirit as one God, Go put on human skin on Christmas Day. What they will remember is Christmas Day. Then for 33 years, walk in their skin. Be tempted with their temptations, but don't give in. You're gonna go into a poor family in a poor part of town. People will say all kinds of things about you. At the end of the day, you're gonna be arrested and accused and mocked for things that you didn't do. And they're gonna put you on a cross for these people. You are dying for the very people that are putting you on the cross. Go do it. What this does for us, what this has to do for us is two things. Number one, allow us to understand how seriously God takes sin. Think about this. God takes sin so seriously that he's like, son, go redeem them. If sin wasn't that big of a deal, couldn't he have just kept slaughtering cows to redeem us? Sin is this big of a deal. Son, go take care of this mess. Secondly, it also, not only does it tell us like how big of a deal sin is, it also shows us how much God loves us that he would do the unthinkable. Ignore, smite, redeem. And he chooses option number three by sending his son to us. Most stories have a pivot point, a point of transition, don't they? Every movie, every novel you read, here's introduction to character, here's the story, things are going well, and then 80% of the story is bad news. Like, here's the conflict, 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 and then finally at the end of the story, comma, but... Comma, however, the hero. Comma, although. But, however, although. You get a call from your, your kids. Hey, mom, 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 I was in a, an accident. But everybody's okay. Whew. So that transition, that pivot point's important. Your parents give you a call. Son, I have stage four breast cancer. But, but the doctors are giving me hope. That transition, that pivot point is really important. Sometimes life doesn't go like that where there is no pivot point, right? Sometimes it's, mom, I got in a car accident and there's no however. Sometimes it's, son, I have stage four terminal cancer, no Aldo. Can you imagine if the story of the gospel didn't have a pivot point? It wouldn't be the gospel. It wouldn't be good news. Here's God, creator, holy, Mankind, disgusting, traitor, unholy, unrighteous. We deserve nothing. But the gospel has a pivot point. It has a transition. It has a but. It has an although. It has a however, and it's a person. And it's Jesus. Romans 6, 23. Let's revisit it. For the wages of sin is death. What you owe, what you are deserved is death. 
It's rightfully yours. You can't wiggle your way out of it. You can't get out of it. You can't justify it. Say, but I didn't really, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. It's part of who you are apart from Christ. For the wages of sin is death. And if that, if Romans 6, 23, if that's all it said, that's horrible news, comma, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God. The wages of sin, what you earned is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here's the good news. What you, owe, what you are owed under contract is death. But God came and gave you a gift. Now, a free gift is not owed. You don't deserve it. There's no contract. There's no legally binding agreement that says, I owe you this. This is God showing up on the scene and saying, listen, I created you in my image to be my glory factor. You ruined it. You traded it in because you wanted all the glory. I have every right to smite you. I have every right to send you to eternal death. But you know what? My, I take sin so seriously that I wanna deal with it. And I love you so much that I wanna give you redemption, I wanna give you hope. So the way I'm going to do that is to give you my son. He doesn't offer a, a goat or some turtle doves, he offers his son. And that becomes the good news, that's the pivot point. In Mark's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it begins with this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark is so smart, he's like, listen, when Jesus Christ shows up on the scene, this is the pivot point. The gospel is the pivot point. It changes everything. It redeems us from our sin. First John chapter two says this, listen to this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So the purpose is, hey, hopefully you'll hear my words and you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, which he probably could have said, but when you do sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for anyone who sins in the whole world. Propitiation is a fancy doctrinal word, which means appeasing God's righteousness or God's judgment, God's wrath. We deserve death. Jesus steps in and says, Father, I've got this. I've got this. And remember, Patsy read this in the prayer this morning. He doesn't say, I got this for a friend. He doesn't step in and die for a buddy, a sinless one. He steps in and dies for his enemy. Like, who is the worst enemy that you have in your life? Think about that. Would you die for them? Not only that, would you send your son, your kid, to die for them? This is how seriously God takes sin. This is how seriously he takes his love for you. So the gospel, God is holy. Man is depraved, totally depraved. Can't do anything to help or fix ourselves but Jesus is the pivot point. The fourth part of the gospel, so we can have this. God is holy, we can have man is depraved, we can have Jesus as the pivot point, but if we don't have this fourth part, it's all for naught. The fourth part of the pivot point is our response. What do we do with it? Notice the formula, God, man, God, man. God, man, Jesus, response. Every time God moves, what do we do in response to it? So the first time God is holy, man falls apart. Jesus comes to redeem. Now, what are we going to do with that information? What are we gonna do with that reality? Everyone in this room has a choice to make. I'm going to reject it or I'm going to receive it. You see, Ephesians 2 says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We've talked about, I've, this is the main message I can ever preach to you. Dead people can do nothing. You can't wake yourself up. You can't fix yourself. You can't take a pill. You can't go to physical therapy or emotional therapy. You can't fix it because you're dead in your trespasses and sin. You're dead. This is who we are according to scripture. But Jesus comes and he's knocking at the door of our hearts. Will you respond to me? I'm trying to breathe life into you. Will you receive that life? And we have a choice to make. Will we respond? We can't fix it ourselves. We can't bring ourselves to life. We must surrender to the lordship of Jesus entirely and completely. That's where we find life. That's where we find life. And when we do, when we do find life and we understand that God is holy and we are wickedly deprived apart from him and we understand what Jesus has done, don't you think it should change our worship? How we sing how we read the Bible, how we choose to live our lives as a living testimony to the glory of God, shouldn't it change everything? Let me close with this. Think about this for a minute. 
Um, have you ever made a mistake that you were forgiven for and you're like, so great, like not from God, somebody on earth forgave you and you're like, whew, that was a close one. And it wasn't a minor traffic violation, it was like a big oopsie. Anybody? And, and when I first started um, ministry, my, my first real job was at Calvary Assembly down the street, big glass one on Fairbanks. And I've told you this before, I was the bottom of the barrel. Bottom, 20 pastors on staff, I was number 30 of 20, okay? I was way down there. Massive pay cut to go there, and I just, I was so excited, man. This is my dream job. It's Gary and Patsy and Melanie's home church. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. I finally got on staff. Um, I don't know if I got on staff because Gary was an elder. I, I couldn't bribe him. I had no money, but, but somehow I got on, on, on staff there, and, and I was the young adult pastor. So I was overseeing college and career from 18 to 29 years old, um, and we had, at our weekly services, it was pretty big. It was about 150 young adults at our weekly service, and one of my first things to do was to plan a ski trip with these guys. So I planned a ski trip to Ski Beach, North Carolina. Um, beautiful up there. And we had about, I, I can't even remember, probably about 100 kids go with us. And I had, I had the responsibility of doing all of the arrangements for it, which I love. I've told you this before. I love doing the arrangements, checking out on Hotels.com, like where we're going to stay, where we're going to eat. I got it all planned out, okay? So this was before Hotels.com. The internet was brand new, and you could do like one page every 90 seconds back in the, the early 2000s. And so I called a hotel, and I reserved 40 rooms. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I'm not even going to tell you what what, what hotel chain it was, but I remember it so clearly. And I reserved 40 rooms for three nights. So 120 rooms cost $10,000 to $11,000. It was somewhere in, in that range, and I reserved these rooms. Well, Rob B. and Rob, this was six months before the event, Rob B. and Rob, over the next few months, I'm looking for a better deal. I'm like, okay, we've got this. I still do this to this day. Lock in a good rate, look for better. Look for an upgrade of some sort. Let, let's try to get it better for these kids. So a couple of months out from the event, I find a really good deal at another hotel. I book 40 rooms for three nights, another 120 rooms. We go on the ski retreat, have a great time. I'm driving the brand new bus. I got a CDL, a, a driver's license to drive bus. I drive the bus up there. And as we're pulling into the hotel, I go over to the canopy and this brand new bus, 5,000 miles on it, hits it with the roof. And I tear the roof off a brand new bus. Good start, rookie. Really good start, rookie. So I'm about 25, 26 years old. The church has just bought this bus. I'm like, I'm screwed. I am so dead. And so that's what I was worried about until we got home. And it was time to reconcile the bank statement and all your expenses, which I love doing that. Anybody else, you sicko like me? Like, that's my jams. It's like balancing the credits and the debt. Let, let's reconcile. That's going to be good. Until I noticed that both hotels charged me for, 100, or, or for 120 rooms. And then I'm like, uh-oh, I forgot to cancel the first hotel. I totally forgot to cancel the first hotel. Ten to eleven thousand dollars. I'm brand new on staff. I'm getting fired. I'm like, it's done. So I called the hotel. I don't even tell my boss. I'm like, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to figure this out without telling my boss. Now, biblically, I guess the re right response is to go to the hotel and go to your boss. I didn't go to my boss. I didn't do it perfectly. I went straight to the hotel. Guys, I screwed up so bad. And I'm telling you, it took some convincing. But at the end of the day, they wiped the slate clean. They said, we will, and, and the dates had already been passed. They couldn't fill those hotel rooms because I had them booked. And they exempted me from having to pay those fees. How do you think I felt? Oh, I'm keeping my job. Whoa, I'm not, I'm not going to prison for scamming a hotel. Like everything in my mind when I'm 26 years old, I'm like, what just happened? But I'm telling you, my, my joy for that chain changed in that moment. Now, today, I, do, I never go to that chain. But it was temporary. <laughs> but how do you think my attitude was? Now, let's compare that to where we are with God today. Those that have been forgiven little, love little. We've all been forgiven of much. We just don't know it. Those that have been forgiven much, love much. So we need to understand God is holy. We're depraved, but Jesus. It always has been, always will be about Jesus. What do you do with that? How do you respond? Do you reject him? Because you have the right. You can reject him. If you do, the wages of sin, what is yours? You reject him. What is rightfully yours is death. You've been warned. You are now accountable to it. You've heard the gospel. But should you choose to accept Jesus' offer, giving your life, surrendering your life completely and wholly to him as both Lord and Savior, then the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, eternal life in heaven with him, hope and purpose here on this earth, joy and peace, and salvation here on this earth. Your choice. 
Your response, that's part of the gospel. That's in your hands. Will you bow your head with me? I want you to take 30 to 60 seconds and sit on that for a moment. Let's just reflect for a minute. This morning, if the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart, and you're like, listen, this I've never taken my sin seriously. I didn't know Jesus was the way, or I've been rejecting Jesus, but today, I, there's something going on in my heart where I just, I, I wanna drop everything, and I wanna surrender to the Lordship of Christ. I wanna be forgiven. I wanna give my sins to him. I want him to be the pivot point of my life and my future. I wanna trade in what I deserve, which is death, and I want to trade it in for the gift that he's given me in life. If that's you today, and you've never done that before, if you've never said, I want to follow Jesus, and, and you're serious, don't do this just because you want to get out of hell free card. But today, the Holy Spirit's doing something in your heart, and like, I, I want to follow Jesus. If he's done this for me, if this is who my God is, if he takes sin this seriously, and if he takes his love for me this seriously, then I, I want that. If, if that's you, can, with nobody looking around, I just want to know who you are so I can pray with you. Would you slip up your hand so I can pray with you? Anybody at all? Okay, here, here's my prayer, and this has been my prayer for all of us this week, is that those of us that are Christians, we are following Jesus, that our worship, whether it's reading the word, it's our daily living, it's how we treat people, it's the songs we sing or how we sing them, would be elevated because we understand what we've been saved from, that we wouldn't just go through the motions on a daily basis or on a Sunday morning, but we have a high and mighty king that redeemed us when we betrayed him. And when we deserved death, he gave us life. This is insane, this is unheard of. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemy, Christ died for us. This is the king we sing to. So this morning, we're gonna sing the chorus of the song we sang just a minute ago, His Mercy is More, which is the story we've been telling this morning. Here's our sin, here's our sin. It's horrible, it's wicked, it's wicked, but his mercy is more. And praise God, I cling to his mercy. So would you stand and let's sing this chorus together and then we will be dismissed.